Brother Marcus. Brother Omar. Brother Omar. I, I need something uh, grapey, uh, lemony. I guess it's acting like uh, we just got here together. Uh, many people will see the tape and the videotape. Wonder why everybody was so lightly greeting each other. It's because we have been talking for a while. <laughs> and uh, we have now uh, stepped forward to have a discussion about the black male secret society known as Sigma Pi Phi, uh, acronym the Boule, B-O-U-L-E. Uh, we will do our best to show you the information related to the Boule. Uh, that's what this lecture is about. I could give the entire lecture and quote every inch of the documentation without looking at it. I know them that well. But this is my responsibility, my night, to show you the information so that you could look at it with me and double affirm the fact that much of our black press, as much as we like it, has not been honest in talking about this group of black men for they respect it very highly and never speak negatively against it. We also know that we've had many black people who've been a member of it and have never ever broken the code or the creed and spoken to one who was a non-member. Though they pledge and swear that their goal is to represent you you will have a hard time believing it when they don't even seek to let you know that they who help you are. And so, in July 17th, 1990, July 18th, 1990, the Los Angeles Times did a front page story on the left column about elite fraternity of black men. Excuse me, brother. I, I, I should be honest, I saw that one get away. <laughs> I'm just shaming myself. I stand back here. Uh, this elite fraternity of black men were described in the article as being influential, as being somewhat like skull and bones at Yale. And as it said these things, I was little in awe as the others, brothers in African Minds United and the Coalition Against Black Exploitation, as we all were intrigued by the fact that this group of men could have been in existence and we not know about them. And even other brothers and sisters, I remember talking to a brother who had been National Executive Secretary of Sigma, uh, 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 Phi Beta Sigma, been in fraternity land 37 years, had heard nothing of the Boule ever, though its founder had been a member. And so, as we began to talk about it with other people around the country, we began to realize that people didn't know about it. How you doing, Brother Warren? And did not knowing that people didn't know about it, we just assumed that it was incidental, that everybody must know something about it, and that it was not mysterious or connected to all of those other things we had previously been talking about, like Cecil Rhodes and and Baron de Rothschild, and all the Halls of Haters, the ADL, and the Diamond Jewish Connection. We've been talking about the Trilateral Commission, uh, who is responsible for this economic summit that you'll be seeing on TV the next three, four days. You need to know that. Anybody? Carl Rowan came on the radio right here in L.A. And my friends jumped him, because we're jumping them in every city. And when they jumped him, he said the Trilateral Commission ain't done nothing. But the Trilateral Commission went to the president and had him set up the annual economic summit starting in 76, France. So when you listen to how your destiny of your country, they say, rides on that meeting, you wonder how Rowan could make such an allegation. But knowing as a boule in Washington, D.C. Epsilon chapter, his goal is to never speak of the high, white, and mighty whom the boule, all 3,300, are sworn to protect. Yes, these brothers that we are pushing up against the wall have taken a sworn oath that they will never expose the whites that they know actually run the world. They, in ambition, 
and in deference to liberation and respect of the race, have agreed to maintain the status quo of white supremacy, which has two levels of white supremacy, a local, limited, parochial side, the Ku Klux Klan, the Reardons, the Kenny Hans, the local clans, but has a powerful, more mighty upper crust, which probably would include Occidental Petroleum and Arco and Exxon and Mobile Oil and the Rockefeller Foundation and other influential wealthy families and institutions. So what we're talking about is why haven't you heard of those people who are in the secret society? It's because the people who you look to, who you would most suspect would tell you, have sworn that they never will. And because of that, that leaves the sub leadership, the other group of people that you like a lot, that leaves them to tell you, the heads of the various organizations as you know them, but if you listen to them, they have never said of these black men, for that they did not know. Which means that Malcolm, we know knew of these men. We know Marcus Garvey knew of these men because their crowning most outstanding achievement was the physical elimination and castigation of Marcus Garvey and the insistence and the climate setting that brought about the death of Malcolm X. For both of those men, international in perspective and insight were a threat to the very whites that they're sworn to protect. You don't get killed for any other reason than jeopardizing the whites of the whites that run the world. Martin King, who was a boule, met the bullet, not for the civil rights thing, but for the international war thing that got two Kennedy boys killed also. So we're looking at a group of men who have protected murderers. So what is the crime of this boule? As we allege, as many of them say, why do you step to my doorstep and accuse me of these things, of which I know not? <laughs> but their so-called limited understanding is in fact defiance and woven into the oath that they swear that they will never even act like they know who these people really are. We have challenged these people on the radio, TV, in the street, on numerous occasions. Kurt Smoke, the mayor of Baltimore. Jesse Jackson, the head of the Rainbow Coalition. Cecil Murray. Now, all the way down the line, these people that we have challenged have never been able to stand up and honestly turn around and say the truth to the matter. And we understand that. So our job is to come to you with the information so that you can make up your mind. There are several affirmations about this process that we must agree to. A Greek is a fraud. A Greek is a fraud. Now, there are a lot of people going to hear this all over the country. And they want to know, do you understand that a Greek is a fraud? So I want you to holler out if you think that a Greek is a fraud. A Greek is a fraud. Oh, let me try that one more time. You might not be ready because this is going to go to people all over the country. And they want to know, they want to know, do you believe this? Because if you believe this, this comes to a certain conclusion that will produce other action which you have affirmed. Is a Greek a fraud? Did the Greek steal from Kemet? Yes. Okay. If the Greek stole from Kemet and a Greek is a fraud, what then is the fate of those who have perpetrated the Greek in spite of the fact? Yeah, fraud. Ah, there you, somebody finally caught on. Yeah. Everybody hollered fraud. Okay, that's the crime, right. Somebody else gave a sentence. <clears throat> the suggestion is clear. That the ebony 
100 most, inf 100 most influential ought to be minus 9. It ought to be the top 91. <laughs> because the 9 Greeks ought to back out while there's still time. I'm making a suggestion to the Greek connection, even to those in the room. You might be just an alpha or a sigma, or a zeta, or an aka. You might just be a little, a little Greek. That's right. <laughs> but you are Greek nevertheless. And soon you're gonna see, because when someone tell me they're gonna back up a move on the boule, the first move you're gonna see on every telephone pole in LA is the Greek thing is dead. That's the first move you're gonna see. And all the Greeks, the Alpha, the Kappa, the Omega, and the and the and the Sigma. Sigma. Show you right. The AKA, the Zeta, the Sigma, Gamma, Rho, and the Delta. They will all be informed publicly. Please do not have a public manifestation of the Greek thing. Don't have a big dinner. Don't have a big reception. Don't put it in the paper that you're coming. Because I suggest to you that we're going to start to visit you at your things. That's right. And ask you to prove your Greek thing on the spot. In the back row will be the cameramen. Because everyone's going to need to see your faces when we show up. We might dress up like a Greek and act a little Greek so you could get a reflection of yourself. I said clearly, if you remember JFK, when they was running around playing Roman. <laughs> All right. So we make a suggestion that we're in the process of penetrating a group of circles. And that these circles are webs which are numerous organizations just beyond the boule. You see, we have done it right here in this room. We have asked members of Greek fraternities to show the handshake to the others in the audience. And on every single occasion, they have refused. And that goes to show that even though we may be in their best interest, there is a bridge that will separate us which cannot be tolerated when we're under attack. We did the lecture Africa 93, we showed that the white man is pushing colonialism without hesitation and he's saying it publicly and openly. And under those circumstances, deviation ha can't be tolerated. So some of you who have asked what can you do will be asked, can you go to the big white hotels where the Greeks give the other Greeks their money? Can you go down there with me? on the night, Friday night, when they got the big dinner. See if we can get some answers for this Greek thing. Hold up some pictures of Greek and ask them, which one is their daddy? Hmm. Or hold some pictures of some fallen Kometans, or Akibalans, or Azanians, and ask, do you support the ones that did this? Hmm. We must confront our people, for it is our people that have tolerated the jam that we're in, and these people are at the top of our people as a guarantee from white people. <laughs> yes, the whites guarantee the boule prosperity and notoriety. I'm telling you, we done put a lot of pressure on these people. Turned a lot of them into flat tires. I saw one of the tires blown up last week in the LA Times trying to put air back in a tire we flattened for supporting the boule. <laughs> Check. Check. <laughs> this is the founder of the boule, Henry Minton. If this was color, you'd see he's light, almost white. Because in the early aspects of the organization, there was a lot of that. Henry Minton is the founder and so-called pioneer in spirit. Brother was kind, knowing I needed a point. Of the organization Sigma Pi Phi, the head man of the organization is called the Grand... Sire Archon, A-R-C-H-O-N, is what a member is called after they have been inducted. They're an Archon. He was the Grand Poopa from 19, uh, 1908 to 1909, then became Grand Sire Archon Emeritus. The Grand Sire Archon 
is the head of the national boule. The head of the local boule is called Sire Archon. So the head of the LA chapter is Sire Archon. A member in any boule is called just Archon. So as Archon is a member, Sire Archon is the local head. Grand Sire Archon is the only head, the titular head. The Grand Sire Archon and those other top positions of the boule have absolute and supreme authority over every boule chapter which are called subordinate chapters. Every subordinate chapter of the boule is compelled to respond to the wishes of the Grand Sire Archon and the Executive Committee. This is a discussion about what Minton was thinking about in 1904 when he wanted to set up the organization. This is from the History of Sigma Pi Phi. That's the history book of the organization. The History of Sigma Pi Phi is written by an alpha named Charles Wesley who wrote the history book for A Phi A as well. Didn't he? <laughs> Didn't he? <laughs> And then the Alphas here? And he, and yes, yes, okay, he did write it, yes. In that, he said, in summary, Minton wanted to create an organization which would partake, in his own words, of, quote, the tenets of Skull and Bones at Yale. Hmm. Now, in the July 18th article on Skull and Bones, excuse me, on the Boule in the LA Times, and I'm going to show you the original article that we first found uh, on the subject. And I want to show you what it says because in the article you get the impression. And I just want to, when they say skull and bones at Yale, that's what they're talking about. That's, that's the logo for skull and bones at Yale. Now, who would want to be patterned after that. <laughs> because that doesn't look positive to me. Now you're already a damn Greek. <laughs> now you done went and got some, some, some poison. <laughs> so that's a double header. Okay, I'm looking for you this opening article. Here we go. This is a little hard to see when I'm up here, so it's a little difficult. Take this off. It's a little warm in here. It's even warmer up here. This is the original LA Times article. Everybody see that? Did you see that? When it ran in 1990? You did see it. No, you didn't see it. What's the date on it? That's July 18th, 1990. Elite Fraternity Widens Agenda of Black Men. This is the original article that came out on the boule that we just casually discussed here at The Good Life which led to this penetration. Because by the time Brother Oswa gets up and starts decodifying a little of that symbolism, you will see that we have in fact cracked a riddle that has contained our people. Our people have been contained by an organized element of secret people who have used riddles, mysteries, and secret societies to jam us. And what we are doing is we are unlocking or decodifying the mystery because once decodified and exposed those who were secret in the light will not be as effective which must be our goal since liberation is not theirs you can't liberate as a Greek you can't liberate in the name of Greece so you may if I say well you know Steve is really a black thing it may be but you ain't gonna liberate called A5A. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Now, watch this. Now come the men of Sigma Pi Phi, a once secret black fraternity. That celebrates the professional and material success of black men. <laughs> Have we had much material success? Well anyway, you can just see how they spend their time. They have big, every year, they have big picnics, 
big annual picnics every chapter. We need to find the park where the new chapter, the, I mean the, 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 the L.A. chapter, um, uh, meets at, because they're going to have a big picnic somewhere, preferably in the Greek neighborhood. Hmm. So we have to find where they're going to be at. So we can go to the picnic. <laughs> Don't you want to go to the Boulay picnic? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Known as Boulay, pronounced Boulay, the group is here. You see, Boulay, Boulay, B O U L E. Known as the Boule, the group is here this week for its biennial meeting and its look at an agenda for the black male in the 90s. Now, Lewis Sullivan, who is head of health and human services, is a Boule member. In fact, a little later on, you'll see him talking about him speaking. It was not in this one, it's in the other one. Where he's speaking, there, there's talking about uh, Lewis Sullivan's name right there. U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Lewis Sullivan. Well, this was about assisting the young black male. <coughs> Says, uh, I'm focusing more on social activism. Too many young black men, said the civil rights group, are underemployed, alternatively feared, and re reveled, and living at a risk. So they're going to help young black men. So how did Lewis Sullivan try to help young black men? The National Violence Initiative. He sought to chemically bust their skulls open and penalize them for being chemically imbalanced which means they were disturbing the Greeks. Hmm. How many of you all saw ABC last night? I asked everybody to watch the program, which was talking about the violence initiative. And did you see the story after that, too? Which was just as deep, the sister from Chicago working for the Koreans, hmm. paid by the United Way. Just like we talked about on the radio. And there was a white man saying that we're not going to let certain prisoners out of jail until we prove they're chemically balanced. Mm. Now you imagine you didn't done your time and a motherfucker telling you you 40 degrees off balance. <laughs> oh brother, this is deep. This sounds funny, but if we don't get together and kick some ass, they're going to cut all us open. We all going to be walking around like this here. We act a little like this now, only we, we do the bunking. <laughs> now, watch this. Watch this, watch this. This I thought was interesting. Almost sounds accidental. Like Yale Skull and Bones, secret society to which George Bush belongs, the Boule has been criticized by some as a social an anachronism and has challenged members to change its image. Like Yale Skull and Bones, secret society. You see, when you hear that, that almost sounds... Like, it's probably like Yale Skull and Bones. But then, when you actually see that it isn't just like it, it was made like it. You see what she did? You see how the article kind of hid the fact that it was pledged to be like Skull and Bones at Yale. See, like Yale Skull and Bones, it doesn't say patterned off of or vowed on the tenets of. It doesn't affirm it as well as we found it when we got the damn book. You see, someone said, well, brother, now we got the article. What more will we need to look for? Is that once someone that we don't like writes something, we know there are ten times more things there once we get it. Anybody that looked at anything, I try to look over it because my eyes look for different things. And all of these people together. Now, I must tell the story again for the record for those who don't know. I lectured at Morgan State. I left here in Los Angeles. Went to Morgan State in Baltimore, gave a lecture by Christian Gregory, uh, who was just in the jet. Dick Gregory's son was the head of the student government there, brought me there to, to Morgan State. I did the little piece on the boule. A sister in the audience heard the lecture, went to her teacher, who was asking her to write a term paper. She said, I'm going to write it on the boule and skull and bones, because I heard the guy mention it at the lecture hall. And he said, well, I'm in the boule. I can't wait to see it. Huh? He asked to take her to lunch. He's a very nice looking sister. He asked to take her to lunch. She called me up. I come back to L.A. She called me here in L.A. at the hotel. Asked me what should she do. I asked her if she could have lunch with him without lifting up her skirt. 
Because that's what the boule wanted. <laughs> wanted the boule. <laughs> right. So, Sister Proudly called that she had gotten a history book from him, which has a huge blue cover. It's coded in blue. Their colors are blue and white. It's a big blue color. We know blue as the color that represents the lower lodges of Freemasonry. Those are the blue lodges, the one, two, three lodges. And we know the tenant that holds the blue lodge together is the code of silence. That's what holds the blue lodge together. The code, that's all they learned. The secrets have not really been taught them. Because they're not taught to them till later on, but they think they know. But the one, two, three lodge is about testing their ability to keep the damn mouth shut. All right, you give me a check on that. Yeah. That's why the United Nations is called the Blue Helmets. That's, right. that's why the police are the men in blue or the blue lights. Check. Because that's what they, and that's why their organization is called the Fraternal Order of Police. Check. And I don't know what Willie Williams thinks. <laughs> but if you take a white boy that's been my enemy, that supported Gates, supported every beating of your head every time, and make that asshole motherfucker deputy mayor <laughs> over the brother. That's right. I'm telling y'all, y'all in big trouble. Y'all excuse my language. But I wanted to emphasize. I wanted to emphasize the danger of the head of the Fraternal Order of Police becoming deputy mayor for public services. That's right. You might not care about politics, and I don't either. They're all whores. That's right. But we better not let them turn a trick and one of them legs kick us in the face. <laughs> so for no other reason. Do it for that reason. <laughs> Boule is a Greek word designating a council of community leaders who advise kings. Hmm. Now a question ought to come up. I understand what a councilor does, but who the fuck is the king? <laughs> now we have a tape where you all remember the book called Black Power? Yeah. It's written by who? Charles Hamilton. Charles Hamilton. And Charles Hamilton. Very good. Charles Hamilton. Four years after he rolled back power, joined the Boulay. Oh. As he then went, started making $100,000 with the Rockefeller Foundation. He went on Bob Law's show recently in New York, and the Cochleites in the bowels of Brooklyn, Harlem, and the other bowels of New York jumped him on the Bob Law show about this Boulay thing. And they misstated the challenge by saying, I think it's a Latin word. He said, yeah, it's a Latin word. But we know it's Greek. He gave them the decoy. They said, who is the king that you serve? And he said, I don't really know nothing about that king thing. We don't serve any king. I mean, we have meetings and stuff, but we don't know of any king. Well, why then do you call yourself that? In your own history book, you will see that you call yourselves the advisors to the king. And the question comes up, if it ain't so, why do you say so? But see, basically, they don't think you have the information. Oh, just for the record, the day the boule was founded, for those of you who do numerological analysis, and I know some of you are into the numbers, the historic date of the founding of the boule, for the record, is May 15, 1904. That is the birth date of Sigma Pi Phi, and it should be written indefinitely on the memory of all members in the fraternity. This day was for Boule, its Founders Day. For on this day, the decision was made to establish this first of the fraternities for college graduates. This date, or the date of the May meeting nearest May 15th, has been celebrated as Founders Day. Now, if you all were at AMU one night, that we did a lecture called L.A. Boule Coup d'Etat Implications. Right. Where I talked about the Coup d'Etat and the JFK movie and about the Boule. And there was a guy sitting in the front row who was in the Boule. That's right. Right. And he said to the audience that he doesn't even read his history book. But we know from the history book that every chapter must review the history book during the month of May. But again, they never count on you having the history book. So they don't answer you as if you know, the answer is if you don't know or never know. That's why they don't like us like they do. Because we're arming you and putting you in a position to demand answers to questions that they never expected they'd have to give up. That's right. This is compelling. 
Uh, we're going to look at some codified things that they talk about. Uh, uh, there's some funny things they say. Uh, from their history book is another dialogue we want to look at. This is, as you can see, History of Sigma Phi Phi. As you see, I write on my stuff. Uh, the things you read, write on. Talk to it. Hold it for a while. Quit throwing it away as soon as you get it. In your house, there's a lot of pressure not to be junky. You'd rather be dead than junky. You'll be dead because you won't read and study, and you don't study because you don't store it. How can you study unless you store it? So because you have pressure to be neat and cool and clean, and look like ultra sheen, <laughs> you throw away the information and fight the dust busters. I suggest your houses need to get slightly more junky. That's right. As you start taping on the wall the information so you can study it, sleep it, dream it, wish it. Pray for the right that you're given the axe the night we have to slay Goliath's head. Pray you get a slash. That's right. Your children are going to ask you, Mama, Daddy, where were you when the liberation came down? Were you in on the victory? That's right. Have something to tell your children. Check. 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 Page 38 of the history book. In the building of the organizational plan. See, what was the niggas thinking about? That's what, I, what was the niggas thinking? Because you're going to sit up in 1904, just got your ass whipped in Reconstruction, just had Africa divided up before your very eyes, colonialized up the butt just after the fake emancipation, civil war, slavery, some still in slavery. You can't pee in a white toilet. You can't eat in a white restaurant. This is fucking 54 years before Rosa Parks. <laughs> you understand what we what period we in? We talking about you got to lean way over to go Greek. That's right. There ain't even no radio or TV yet, so somebody had to tell you about them. You couldn't even read about them. You couldn't see nothing about them or hear nothing about them. There was no TV and no radio in 1904. So when you talk about you gonna set yourself up like tenants of skull and bones at Yale, you better believe somebody in around this boule and we checking on this history of Minton may have been a skull and bones at Yale as damn self. Passing for what? In the building of the organization plan, reliance was placed upon Greek history and tradition. See, and they're gonna tell you. To ask them niggas in that, I say now look. Hey, in the fraternity and sorority thing. Hey, y'all really Greek or y'all like African on the slide? <laughs> they say, no, brother, it's really African. The white Chevrolet blocking cars that can't get out. Is that you, brother? Check. Okay, we're straight. Thank you, sister. And so, the first, this is the first of the Greek thing. This is the granddaddy of the Greek thing. Here it is. That we see that they placed how much on the, the organizational plan? Reliance was placed on Greek history. So when you confront them, they're going to swear it ain't a Greek thing. And you're going to tell them, say, well, I've seen your thing, and I know your thing is Greek from the jump. And no subordinate boule, Archon, can ever deviate from the structure and the guidelines laid down by people in the organization higher than them. Never. Does a private disrupt the sergeant who does not fuck with the lieutenant, who does not contradict the general, who does not talk back to the major? And how many stars a general you are don't talk against the president? So when you're in a hierarchy, you are controlled from the top down. The bottom could be honest people, but they must do what the top tell them. That's the deal. So if you're in the army, you know it's someone over you. Even if you Colin Powell. Mm. Colin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm holding my Colin. Check, check, check. Come on. Come on. Okay. Oh, you know what, bro? Anyway, I think that. I'm going to need some of Okay. Let me see if I can tighten that up a little bit. Okay. The reasons for this action are not difficult to discover. For it was well known that the study of Greek civilization was basic to 
unacquaintance with Western civilization. Which means, what do that say? Say, we better learn Whitey if we're going to get with Whitey. Check. Check. And all who came after them is Whitey on the slide. Somebody get mad and throw their rings back and shit and reveal all the secrets. <laughs> but you have been told that the other members will beat you if you do. And I tell you now, if one of you break away from them funky fake Greek organizations and someone even threatens you, please tell me we will show them the law. That's right. The law. That's right. This ain't constitution. It's the law. Acquaintance with Western civilization. Although Greek culture had relations with the culture of the Orient, holy man, seemed like they skipped over somebody. Let me go back. <laughs> you see, this might not just be an affirmation of Greek, but this is a denial of Africa. This is more than just, I'm for this. This is, I must not even recognize any other. Thou shalt worship no idols before the Greek. Right. And then go jump over to the Orient. Ain't that some shit? Look at this shit. There it is. There it is. Let me go back. The reasons for this action are not difficult to discover, for it is known that the study of Greek civilization was basic to an acquaintance with Western civilization, although Greek culture had relations with the culture of the Orient. Moreover, the Greeks were successful in their creation of free institutions. I ah, damn it. Brother Ashwa Kwesi, were the Greeks successful in building Greek free institutions? In fact, in the story on colonialism is back and not a moment too soon, they bragged that the Greeks were the first colonialist. Mm. The first colonialist. Mm. Moreover, the Greeks were successful in their creation of free institutions and of organized city-states. Those were colonial states. They organized colonies. They forced people to serve them. They turned it over to the Roman. Reference was made repeatedly by Dr. Jackson and his five associates. There were six members in the starting of the Boule. Six members in the starting of the... Isn't that strange they took such a number? Couldn't have found us another one. It was in this, let's see, uh, Dr. Jackson and his five associates to the heroic and early age of Greece. It was this period that the concept of the boule was formed. This was the council of chiefs, the leading noblemen of the heads of families. The boule of Homeric times was a body of princes who were advisory to the king. So when we asked them who's the king, they said, well, where'd you get that from? In Salome's time, the Athean Boule was a senate of elected men who numbered 400. 100 from each of the four Ionic tribes. They prepared bills for the action of the popular ecclesia. Their number was later increased to 500, chosen by lot, and again was reduced to 300. The name has persisted in Grecian history. In modern times, the lower house of the parliament of Greece, a body of 250, was known as the Boule in modern times. Lower. The, the what house? Lower, lower house. Lower. What does that mean by definition? That there's, somebody the lower house. House. that there's somebody on the second floor, these niggas on the first floor. That means that when we talk about that they take the position of being a Grecian sphinx, we understand they're blocking for another person who got the ball. And that's the mystery to the boule as to why they will never own up who really has it because they think if you don't know who got the ball, you won't know what to tackle. So their goal is to knock you down and assure that their white man can score touchdowns. In, in England, House of Lords, House of Commons, the Senate, the Congress, the owner of the plantation, the overseer. Understand, this is, understand, 
Imagine you're on a plantation and there's a guy on a horse with a whip mm. making sure you're working. Mm. Wait, oh. And never thinking about who's in the house and never seeking to overthrow what they know was illegal. Mm. Mm. Counselors had to pass an examination in which their past lives were passed in review. We know that in Skull and Bones at Yale, when you do your initiation, you have to lay in a coffin butt naked. And you have to talk about your past lives, and everyone has to hear compromising stories about yourself that you tell other members to protect you from ever getting out of line. That's right. You seal your secrets in all the members. So there's a lot of homosexuality going on. I know Erwin France, who's a big time boule in Chicago, is big time homosexual. Big time. Big time. An oath was taken to observe the laws, to give advice according to the best to his best power, and to examine his successors with fairness. Anyway, that's interesting. Let's go back over here a second. We don't want to appear as if we were remaining above the problems of most black people. We know we didn't get here solely by the dent of our own hard work. We owe a lot of people and we have to give back to our brothers and sisters. So you already know that they say they owe you. Right. right. Now you just knew who they were. So you can collect. <laughs> now the first Boulay chapter, the first Boulay chapter, oh yeah, bro, we got it all. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. Dang it. This is the, this is from the rostrum of Sigma Pi Phi. And this talks about the date, the, not the date, but the order. Every chapter is named after a Greek letter of the alphabet. When they finish, they start the alphabet over with alpha. And then, after you run out of alphas, you go into beta alpha and beta beta. Now, seeing that they run out of letters, you think they go get some cometan shit or something, you know? Since they ain't got enough Greek letters to hold on. Now, imagine you had an organization in Philly, Chicago, Baltimore, Washington, New York, St. Louis, Kansas City, Detroit, Atlanta, Columbus, Northern New Jersey, Houston, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, Pondo, Arkansas, Pittsburgh, Dayton, Cleveland, Charleston, Nashville, Tuskegee, Louisville, New Orleans, Virginia, Berkeley, Cincinnati, Dallas, Tallahassee, Indianapolis, Oklahoma. You see what I'm saying? These niggas got somebody in every city and they still ain't doing shit for the people. You have no organization in America in that many damn cities. But now you've got 3,000 of the wealthiest black men of your race aligned in every city, including Liberia, Monrovia. Mm. And don't bust a grape. Mm. If, the, if one boule in every one of them cities told on a white man, you'd be in better shape. <laughs> First chapter was Philadelphia. It started in 1904 in Philadelphia. Second chapter, Chicago. Daniel Hale Williams, first man to do a heart surgery. He was one of the founding members of the Chicago boule. Percy Julian, T.K. Lawless, many of famous doctors were also boule members. Third chapter started in Baltimore, the Carey family. Anybody from Baltimore, you know about the uh, Careys uh, and, and Carringtons. Uh, fourth chapter went to Memphis, Tennessee. Fifth chapter was Washington, D.C. Carter G. Woodson, Ernest Just, Elaine Locke. What? Carter G. Woodson evolved. He was the Negro before he wrote about the using of the Negro. He wanted revenge. He later wanted to tell about what being a Negro was about. Because the whole thing to the boule. If you get the tape black and Jewish relations, and you should, and different times I mention tapes, you might want to slide to the table and try to grab them, because they ain't going to be there, especially after I finger the tape. In the black and Jewish relations, remember we talked about how when the Jewish black alliance developed, that it was wealthy Jewish people and college educated blacks. There were no wealthy blacks. The first black millionaire was from Memphis, Tennessee, and he got it in 1900, Robert Church. That was the first black millionaire. As you can see now, here's Los Angeles. Los Angeles is the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14th chapter. L.A. is the 14th chapter. What do you call that in Greek? 11. <laughs> That's Roman. Kai. 
What do you call this? What? <laughs> they get smarter. <laughs> so that's what the LA chapter was. And as you can see, some of the later chapters coming in, Albany, Georgia, Tyler, Texas, now they start getting into even the smaller towns. Northern Illinois, Columbus, Georgia, San Jose, California. Let's see, let's look at some other California chapters. So you know people in those cities. There's Pasadena, Sacramento. Let's see here. San Francisco. Uh, Any more? There's uh, Monrovia, Liberia. Because that's where they went to stop Marcus Garvey. You had to have Boulay in Monrovia. You're going to stop Marcus Garvey over there. Boston Harbor, Lansing, Durham, Toledo. San Diego. San Diego. Seattle nearby. Oakland, Berkeley. And that's in Los Angeles. So you can get an idea of what they have. They're now, I think at this time there were about 90 chapters. They're now into the 100th chapter. Their rostrum, we have the list of all of their names. This is what their rostrum says on the inside. This directory has been prepared to serve as an important and useful source of information and data for subordinate boulets and for individual archons and to facilitate the communication processes within the fraternity. It is for the exclusive use of the members of members of Sigma Pi Phi fraternity and it is not for public scrutiny. It is not to be duplicated whole or in part for distribution outside the fraternity. Sigma Pi Phi ended 1990 with a total of 3,245 members and 94 subordinate boulets. It talks about recent chapters bringing in. So remember, you're hearing not because they wanted to. Somebody says, well, how could they be so bad? They've never been secret. When you can look at their list of names, they tell you. They, tell, they give every member a list of names. And they tell that member, you better not tell nobody. <laughs> and this is their directory. This is the names of every Boulay member in the country. <laughs> and if you look at the list, if you look at a list, you need to see how thorough this is. This is why, this is why they're scared. Every Boulay list has their home address on it. <laughs> every Boulay member. That was for the king. We could knock on their door <laughs> and visit them personally <laughs> to get a bet. It's Carl T. Rowan. Oh! 3116 Benzendine Street, Northwest. Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. This is the Washington, D.C. list. There's C. Payne Lucas. He's at Africa. He was one of them shaft in that. He was at the shaft in Africa meeting. The Black Summit which was financed by the Ford Foundation, which we proved helped kill Malcolm X. What's his address? Right. 4241 Matheson Drive, Northwest. Here's Vernon Jordan, oh, nigga yeah. in the White House. Oh. Uh, here's Ron Boulay Brown. <laughs> oh, he on the other page. Huh? Let's see. Yeah, he's on the B's. He's on a page before this. Uh, so you can see, you can see that the Boulay don't want this type of information public because it's all inclusive. So you understand that when we say we're asking them something, you understand how many options we have. Give us an LA. Give you LA. <laughs> yeah. As soon as you know why, I'm gonna show you. Show you right. <laughs> this is uh, the author of the Boulay. It's Charles Wesley. That's another book he wrote. The author of the Boulay History Book. Charles Wesley also wrote that book. Anybody ever heard of that guy? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Prince Hall. Show you right. Prince Hall Masons. All right. We need to ask them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now. Well, that's all right. That's all right being a Prince Hall Mason. And we ain't got nothing against about being a Mason or. Just when we ask you a question, we want an answer. You better get it right. You better get it right. <laughs> Show you right. Someone asked they wanted to see Ron Brown's address. There's Ron Brown's address. 722 Unicorn Lane, Northwest Washington. And the secret group that financed the uh, summit in Africa, that's the vice chairman of the International Self-Help Institute, Andrew Brimmer. You saw him on that list. 
There's Clifford Alexander, former secretary to the Army. You might have remembered him from the uh, Carter administration. Now, there's a series of things I want to lay up here for you. Everybody all right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a little tedious, so you got to hang with me. All right, all right. This is our last night. And I want to make sure we got everything going right. Now, watch this. Now, let's imagine, what's our goal? One of our goals ought to be to sneak in the night they're having a boule ceremony. You know, initiation. Yeah. One thing that is not in the history book is the ritual. It's very, I need to tell you this, because one day I'm going to come back and say, I got it. I'm going to say, I got it. I got it. We're trying now to get the ritual process. You can see here, there's a clue to something about the ritual here. Riding the hump. Oh, we're going to check it. Getting the goat, huh? Getting the hump. <laughs> Look at this. Archon Wesley was in charge of the initiation, of whom it was said, quote, he always succeeds in impressing upon the candidates for membership, the dignity and solemnity of such an occasion. It is... Y'all gotta let me do the talking. I, if it's, I don't have no amplification. I gotta shout over you. It is of interest to observe that the dress of the archons who composed the initiation team was most impressive. They were robed in Greek costume and each had a fillet around his head. Now, what is a fillet? Huh? A little headband or something? What's a fillet? A little leaf thing? All right. Okay. Huh? Or you're blindfolded. Or you're blindfolded. Very good. Very good. And it says they were robed in what kind of costume? Greek. So don't let them tell you they ain't, in, they ain't in no Greek thing. When you say, nigga, when you walked across the sands, you wore a robe. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway. They were robed in Greek costume. Don't forget that. Robed in. We need to. And that means every one of them in that closet got a Greek outfit. Check. Check. Yeah. All right. That's going back to what a boule is. All right. Now. Here is the cover of the history book. That's the cover of the history book. That's what the cover of the history book looks like. The history of Sigma Pi Phi. As you can see, right, the first of the Negro American Greek letter fraternities by Charles Wesley. And that was the uh, anniversary issue. We have found about three or four different versions of the book as it's been updated. We have a 55 version, we got a 69 version, and we got an 83 version. So we're constantly trying to keep up with them. As fast as they get them, we try to steal them. <laughs> we're doing our best to keep you up with them as fast as possible. Now, I need to show you, I thought this was interesting. This is the uh, boule when it was founded in, in, in uh, Memphis. You can see that they use esoteric symbolism sometimes as they put the triangle behind them. Now that was the Memphis chapter when it started. I thought that was a little interesting that they aligned themselves like that. Look like what? Yeah, you see they all light on the page. But that's, uh, that's uh, about what we would suspect. Now we know, we know that that wasn't a Greek symbol. Check? Check. We know, if you just even take the book by Brother James, Brother George James, Stolen Legacy, and if you just look into the index at the front of his book and start looking at certain things that he says in the index, you will dispute all of the tenets that are listed in the Boulay History Book. In other words, in the Boulay History Book, it talks about Aristotle was the first to do this. Plato was the first to do that. Socrates did this. Right? You can take Brother George James's book, 
who may have died a Masonic death. Yes, sir. Right. Right. Who died a Masonic death. And just look at the opening part of his book. You must get the book. Because this book will assist you in this exposing to the boule why they are a fraud and a fake. And you can do it by using his book and, and he talks to you in the book about why he did the book and what was his desire for doing it. And if you have no rationale of your own, use his. Consequently, this step of the African legacy by the Greeks led to the erroneous world opinion that the African continent has made no contribution to civilization and that it as a people are naturally backwards. This is the misrepresentation that has become the basis of race prejudice which has affected all people of color. Mm. So if you don't want to check it for no other reason, understanding that doing the Greek thing magnifies and plays into the dominant element that subjugates our people worldwide that we were an inferior people. You with that? Yeah. Yeah. Let me get some check on it then. Yeah. All right. Now, let me see what I got here. I say this is a little hard to do uh, because it's hard lining them up. Uh, let's see here. This is another little picture about skull and bones. This is from, uh, I want to show this because this is from uh, the covert action when they did something on skull and bones. But they mentioned that in the CIA there was a thing called a bone cell. In other words, you take the CIA and they're a secret group and then you double seal a secret. You set up a mission, say we're going to kill Malcolm X. You set up a mission where not only are they CIA, but they may be double webbed into another organization that compels double secrecy. You with me? Right. So now you're trying to protect the secret and you're welding it two times. You're putting a double lock on it. So when we saw that spy story that had come out about uh, the spy story that had come out um, uh, in the Memphis Commercial Appeal, uh, when we saw the spy story, we saw that there were numerous black men who were in on the spy story who in fact were also Boulay members. Which means that they may have been a cell. And that uh, is important to us because that means you're double sealing a mission. And uh, we have to keep up on that level. Now looking for a certain something I want to drop up here and show you right now. This is a uh, an old Boulay journal. They have a magazine called the Boulay Journal. That's what the old Boulay Journal looked like. Then came a later version of the Boulay Journal to look like that. Uh, as they're constantly uh, redoing their fronts, this is the founding of the DC chapter. Some of those names, if anybody's in here on Omega, you'll see Ernest Just, Carter G. Woodson, uh, uh, e. French, Tyson, E.C. Williams, Garnett, Wilkerson, Milton, Francis, John Francis, Kelly Miller, Miller, Charles West, Ernest Just, James Cobb, Robert Terrell, Roscoe Bruce, Fonzo, just every chapter usually has a picture in the history book like this of the members when they formed that chapter. Again, uh, for their own history, uh, for their own uh, group, uh, allowing each of them to protect uh, what is important to them, which is their tradition. This is a very important thing for them. Of course, we know that there's a group of them. And they work in and out of a group. We know, as we look later, that they work off the number nine. That the nine number includes the four male and the four female, which in fact gives us a clue that it's a package deal. That we could not just be against one, we had to be against all, because they all were hooked together and that no one was any separate from the other. Let's see here. Here's a, a eulogy to Charles Wesley who wrote the history book. In this eulogy to Charles Wesley we learned several things about the boule which we had not learned in the past. This was uh, quite an accident. In fact, let me just slip this up ahead of you. This was the story from the Memphis Commercial Appeal, the Army's Black Spy Network. That was the story, uh, you all might have heard about it on KPFK uh, 
Uh, somebody read it out to you. Army's Black Spy Network dates back to 1917. I'm not going to spend all night showing this, but here, right here, Baker's special assistant was Emmett Scott. Newton Baker says here, the spy system that would question the loyalties of black Americans for generations began May 3rd, 1917. That day, Secretary of War Newton D. Baker ordered Von Demon to crank, to crank up the department's sleepy military intelligence division. Newton Baker had a special assistant's name was Emmett Scott. Emmett Scott became the grandsire archive of the Boule. Robert Fulton, Booker T. Washington's successor at Tuskegee Institute, came aboard, as did C.V. Ronan of Nashville, who sent Loving, who will work for Demond, a list of potential black informants and troublemakers. So we're looking at four Boule men who in the early 1900s were locked into a story that really came out about Martin King. The key to the story was that when we investigated the names, we found out they were Boulay members. I bring that up in collaboration with the earlier shot I showed of the, um, of the uh, sale of Skull and Bones at Yale. Because they then began to depend upon the Boulay to identify people around the country. Which is very interesting because that meant that you could be fingered unjustly. Wouldn't it be something some old boule come up and fingered you as a troublemaker? This is a, a modern day boule journal, the inner sleeve of the boule journal, listing the officers of the grand boule. I think I'll use this as a chance to show you what the officers are, what positions are in the boule. I'm not good at saying Greek, so you have to bear with me as I read what that Greek name is. See, this was the grandsire Archon. This was the immediate past grandsire Archon. This is the grandsire Archon elect, who just resigned as a new guy now. This was the grand grammatuus. That's the next position of the grandsire Archon. Then the position is grand. <laughs> how do you say that? The dark. Grand. The source. The source. Okay? I ain't good at Greek, so I ain't gonna be able to do it good. This was a guy who became school superintendent in Chicago. The, uh, Dr. Matthew G. Carter, he was the grand grafter. This guy was the grand leading archon. This guy is the grand lecturing archon. The next guy is the chairman of the Committee on Audit and Budget. Theodore Jones, interestingly enough, when Coin and Tell Pro came out, Theodore Jones, who was the uh, chairman of the board of the NAACP got revealed as having been an FBI informant for J. Edgar Hoover. Well. He was always, for many years, the treasurer of the Boulay, and between 84 and 86, he was the grandsire archon of the Boulay. The, the chairman of the Social Action Committee, chairman of the Constitution Committee. So those are some of the positions that make up uh, Boulay. And uh, uh, we be up on that, uh, basing it on, in fact, here are the current Boule leadership disappeared. <laughs> See, if you don't know the names or aren't familiar with it, they can put it right in front of you, and you wouldn't notice it. This is the Society World page of Jet Magazine, August 10th, 1992. It's hidden right in the middle of the story. Well, there we go. It's right up top. Yeah. Cocktail Chit Chat. <laughs> when the 41st Grand Boule of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity convened at the Plush, they always brag about how plush or how prestigious their location is. Western Crown Center Hotel in Kansas City, immediate past grass, Archon Benjamin Major of Oakland, California, passed the gavel to the new grandsire Archon Hugh D. Perkins of Baton Rouge. Anybody know him? Or know of him? I'd like to know what he does. Uh, African Americans working together for progress. <laughs> it's like I can go with you but not know you. I'm going to marry you but never met you. Was the theme of the Boulay's, was the theme of the Boulay. Roy Roberts, manufacturing manager of General Motors Corporation, Flint Automotive Division, was the dynamic keynote speaker. An evening dinner lecture of the history of Kansas City jazz at an enjoyable picnic where 
more than 784 archons and their families feasted on some of the delectable gauges and sun barbecue. <laughs> Can we get some pictures of that bull that eating them bones? <laughs> were among the bull highlights, accolades were heaped upon the general chairman, Elmer Jackson Jr., and his state of boule, Kansas City, Archons, and the Archousers. A boule wife is called an Archouser. <laughs> and uh, when a boule member dies, his boule pin has to be given to the wife to be buried in his grave with him. It has to be buried in his coffin. Uh, to get in the boule, a person has to. Uh, uh, to get into the boule, a person has to recommend you. Your name is taken to a boule committee. The committee investigates your history. Having investigated your history, they have a vote recommending you for membership or not. Then you are approached and asked. In other words, thousands may be investigated and never initiated. You understand that? Yes, sir. In fact, um, here's a, let me see, here's some Boule, Boule song. Boule is uh, steeped in symbolism. Here's a picture of Emmett Scott, who I showed you on that article, as he became the Grand Sire Archon at the meeting that was held in Los Angeles in 1941. And I said, as I mentioned earlier, isn't it strange that the Boule meets in Los Angeles and meets up at the Greek Theater in Griffin Park? <laughs> and I went up there after the radio show the other day and looked at the symbolism up in Griffin Park and uh, at the Greek Theater and at that Manly Palmer Hall location that sits down another one of those streets Manly Palmer Hall, who was a big-time Masonic writer. And uh, there's a ton of symbolism uh, hidden in and around those areas. And uh, uh, soon uh, we'll get it on videotape and share it with you. Uh, some of the things we saw uh, that we went around uh, on that little escapade there up in the mountain. Uh, selection of Emmett Scott as grandsire. Our child was one of the singular events of the Sigma Popeye's history, which had significance for its war relationships during these years. Archon Scott had served during World War I at the years 1917 to 1919 as Special Assistant to Secretary of War Newton Baker. Well, that only verifies where he was, but it doesn't say he was a spy. Which the story collaborated he was. Now y'all all right? Y'all need intermission? No. no. Y'all look like y'all hot. Now let the people standing up. Make some decisions. Y'all all right? Yeah. Y'all okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's get into, let's get into a little further the symbolism of the organization uh, and where uh, it picks up a certain things. Speaking of symbolism, uh, let me set that up there a minute and you look at that. See if you can get the symbolism out of that. Thank you, brother. <laughs> See if you can get the symbolism out of that. Maybe somebody might want to stand up and say what that is. That's the cover of the book written by that white guy. Right? Y'all remember that? Yeah. What's that other picture up there? Skull and bone. What's that at the feet? What's that at the feet? What's that at the feet? Black dragons. Some black dragons biting at Clinton feet. Clinton is on what? White horse. And what did it say what happened when the white horse came? Yeah. 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 Hey, check. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how, many, how much How much do they need to tell us before we know what they mean? Mm. Uh, do, I need, do we need to say any more? No. So that's the climate under which we operate. Here's what they call a boule song. Listen to this. Let me take a sip here. <laughs> Give me a one and a two. One and a two. From far. <laughs> so you're right. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you. From far and near, you've traveled here over rough and rocky road to reach the open portals of Sigma Pi Phi blessed abode. 
our hearts, our homes, to you belong, and glad we are that you have come to share our fellowship song, to share our fellowship song. Each Archon who has dared to taste of the cup that threatened death, dear Sigma Pi Phi will defend with his life and dying breath. Should any, any for a Greek assail, his cunning words shall not avail. Our ears are deaf to envy's tale, even deaf to envy's tale. You hear that? They're saying, y'all going to jam us for being a Greek, and we're telling you now, we can't hear this shit. And we won't listen to this shit, because we'll defend what we are to the death. As long as you call a decision, I'll bring you the game. I'm going to read that again. Because there's symbolism in here that we have yet to fully decodify. It says, each archon who has dared to taste of the cup that threatened death. In the ritual, they must use some cup with some liquid to symbolize something. And say, you tell. That's poison in the cup. Dear Sigma Pi Phi will defend with his life and dying breath. Should any for a Greek assail. They put Greek in quotation marks. For any, for any, should any for a Greek assail, his cunning words shall not avail. Our ears are deaf to envy's tale, even deaf to envy's tale. Though elsewhere bickerings annoy, here at least our peace and joy. Where friendships built on faith abound, strife and discord near are found. Then drink together, Archons dear, the cup of fellowship and cheer. For as the apple of the phi, as of the eye is to us, Sigma Pi Phi. For as the apple of the eye is to us, Sigma Pi Phi. The apple of the eye. What do that mean? He's the best thing to him, man. The apple of my eye. You know, that's the prettiest thing. Like, the prettiest girl or something. That's the best thing that could ever happen. Mm. Yeah, the, other, the other thing when they say... The house, the, the boat, the yacht, the, the cars. The, the death from the cup. That, that's what that symbol you had. The skull and cross. That's the poison symbol. That's on everything. Yeah. The cup, the cup is the cup. representative of the grave. Of the grave? Grail. 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 It's interesting that he brought up the word that the cup is symbolic of the grail. Because what we found out is, is that when you're a skull and bones, when you go over, you're called a knight. <laughs> <laughs> and the knight is symbolic of the knight of the round table. And that that round table is the code word or the buzz word for an upper, upper secret society that's in a book called Anglo-American Establishment written by Carol Quigley. And in that book, he said in the opening that that secret society of which the Rhodes Scholars come from is known as Several names. This society has been known at various times as Milner's Kindergarten, as the Round Table Group. Okay, just hold it right there. Look at that page a second if you can read it. Because that page is very significant to the discussion of who it is might be the ones that the boule has to cover for. In other words, they're covering for something. Now we know whatever they're covering for is beastly. Check. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. Now that's from Carol Quigley's book. That was the guy who Clinton thanked during his inauguration. I mean, not doing not when he won the Democratic convention. He thanked Carol Quigley in his speech. He said, "Carol Quigley is the guy that got me over to Yale. I mean, got me to to uh, Oxford." And it was Carol Quigley, who we showed here, has been called the Joe Valachi of political secret societies by his buddies for revealing the fact that, the, uh, that uh, there was such a secret society. I thought it was interesting that in the... Con everybody through reading that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've said it every lecture I ever had a lecture. 
Now we only better collaborate with the ones who we were always after. So I know we got these suckers. In the book by Manly Palmer Hall on the flower plant, plants, fruits and trees, there was a tree showing the Knights of the Round Table. What I thought was interesting when I looked at the tree carefully is that in your mind we always thought about the tree in 12. But if you look carefully, it says the tree of the Knights of the Round Table, you find out that there are one knight, two knights, three knights, four knights, five knights, six knights, seven knights, eight knights, nine knights. Ooh. Those nine represent the symbolic nine that's used in the Grecian Sphinx, which we'll be talking about shortly. Now we're going to show from that eulogy of uh, Charles Wesley's. In that same uh, book, that same night, we found this in tribute to Wesley. Look carefully at the wordage. I'll give you a second to read it. You find that for some reason they take Alfred Lord Tennyson and put him on the left side and put Wesley on the right side and the only thing is similar in both discussions is the damn word round table. Model for a mighty world. What's that in the man's hand? What's that in the man's hand? Brother Quasi? Does that have any symbolism there? That little spike with the light on it? Oh, yes, sir. What's, what, what would that mean? Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus is the one who stole the light. All the Greeks had to pass the burning sands, the burning sands coming across the Sahara to Mount Olympus is where the light was from Ethiopia. That's why we got the Statue of Liberty, because the French gave America the Statue of Liberty because they are the land they stole. They got the new light. Oh, shit. Stole. You see what happened? Where's the light going from? Which hand to which hand? It's going from the left That's to the right. right. So the white man just stole the light and he gonna let the boule hole on it. <laughs> when it was theirs from the jump. And that's what the stolen legacy does. It gives and powers one who's thieved. Now, whatever they're saying up there, it must be in cold because it don't make no damn sense when you read it. In the fair order of the table round, a glorious company, the flower of men, who rode about redressing human wrong. They spoke no slander, nor, nor listened to it, when served as a model for a mighty world, they loved one maiden only. One maiden. What is that? What is a maiden? What's a maiden? A woman that stole somebody. So they say it's a group of maiden horses running. Those horses stole on. It's a woman that's been untouched. A virgin. A woman that's been untouched and pure. Yeah, a virgin. A virgin. A maiden. They loved one maiden only. That don't mean they wives now. And they lived for her through years of noblest deeds. And then here come Wesley. Here come Wesley with some more cold shit. <laughs> the round table lives. Now he jumps down and makes it make believe again. Only in poetic life and history. They can live again in us. And we can make them live through us. It can continue as a dream, and it can continue again through us. Us means who? Huh? The boule. Now, let's go back one. We just heard from Carol Quigley, who talked about the top of the top of the white secret societies. And he says it's known by several names, which you knew that the, anything you ever read on the Illuminati says we will have numerous names. You will not know it as one name. It does not even go under the name Illuminati. That is that Illuminati you've been looking for. Oh, round table, round table, that's it. And the boule will never acknowledge knowledge of it because it's their goal to protect it and keep it secret. Maybe that's why they didn't want to tell us who they were, because then we'd have to say, well, what are you doing standing there? Well, I'm going to save this one, because when you come, I want you to go back to that. I'm going to lead this up for you, just right. Now, let's go to the boule 
Yeah, here we come. The Grecian Sphinx. Here they come. I'm getting ready to now verify from their constitution. It's like court trial. I really should have set it up like court, but I didn't have time. We had too many things to manage. Uh, trying to deal. I, I, I suffered from not having this together because I've been all day in Long Beach on my knees trying to get this stuff out of that place before we leave out of here tomorrow. And uh, that's why I jump hard at the people who try to jump at me because my time is the time, the time I have is the time I do this. And any time I have to do other things, then uh, I take away from what I'm, what I'm doing. This is from the Constitution of Sigma Pi Phi as revised August 84. Article 1, name, symbol, seals, colors. The name of the organization shall be Sigma Pi Phi. The symbols shall be corresponding letters of the Greek alphabet Sigma Pi Phi. Now there are people who will break this down 50 ways and take you 50 more ways. And I can spend some time telling you some of the things they taught me, but we'll have to save that for another trip. It says here, oh, let me go back. At the end of that line was the seal of the fraternity. Uh-oh, got to bring it down a little bit. Excuse me a second. The seal of the fraternity shall consist of the Grecian Sphinx and urn and the Greek letter Sigma Pi Phi encircled by a hand bearing the word Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity Incorporated encircled by a hand. Now, you remember we talk about the hidden hand. The hand. Those articles uh, where they're always telling you something negative about what they're doing and they always show you the hidden hand doing it. Now you see that picture of hands? Now you say, well what are them hands just doing out there? Well the story is called Colonialism is Back. And not a moment too soon. And it openly advocates taking over Africa. Openly. New York Times, August 18th, 1993. Well, I'm going to get all this stuff for you, too. You, 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 you'll want this. I mean, they openly advocate it. But this is who they show is doing it. The date on that, 1982? August 18th. 1993, Sunday, New York Times August, Magazine. August, 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 August. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. April 18, 1993. I appreciate that. Check, check on the correction. But you see little black hands at the bottom and big white hand at the top. And H-A-N-D means something. Different color hands. Show, show. And the hand says, let's face it, some countries are just not fit to govern themselves. We're witnessing today a revival of colonialism in a new form. It's a trend that should be encouraged. It goes right on to say we're going to take the fuck out of Africa and enlist the ten countries they take in first. This is New York Times, Sunday Magazine. It's the lead paper in the damn country. This is the American paper of the world. This is April 18, 1993. What's ten? Huh? What's ten? Oh, get the tape, Africa 1993, because I'm, I'm going to stop, it's, it's loaded with stuff, but the point of it is I want to show you them damn hands, so when he says over here, when he says the Greek letter Sigma Pi Phi encircled by a hand bearing the word Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, that ain't no arbitrary dialogue, <laughs> only for the verification of what hand they talking about. And so they call it, what we're looking for here is, it says the colors of the fraternity shall be blue and white. It says the official insignia of the fraternity shall be a pen bearing the figure of a Grecian sphinx and urn with the Greek letter Sigma Pi Phi inscribed beneath, of which may be appropriately adorned with jewels. The title of the pen is vested in the Grand Boulet. The pen shall be worn by the archons only on the left side of the vest or shirt. In case of loss of pen, section 3, upon the death of an archon, the pen shall be left in the custody of his widow to be buried or cremated with him. Otherwise, it shall be returned to his subordinate boule. Mm. That's deep. I thought it was interesting that when Warren Christopher went to the Middle East, Brother Ashwa, place he went was to the space and I need you to teach us something about this about why he may have went there 
and in the story it says his code name is Spinks. This is the vice chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a part of that secret society that Cecil Rhodes set up. He's the vice chairman of it. That's why he chaired the commission on your rebellion. Because he's in charge of all Negroes. He's now Secretary of State in charge of Negroes worldwide. <laughs> Secretary of State Christopher walks from the Sphinx, which he called, quote, a reminder of the tremendous contribution e Egypt has made to modern civilization. Now, them ain't the right guys, buddy. Boy, them are not the guys. But he went there. Early, early on his first day of his just concluded Middle East trip, before the official talks with Egyptian leaders were to begin, Christopher made a walking tour of the nation's most famous landmark, the Pyramids and the Sphinx. And about why he's there and what's there. So now we know that the logo is called the Grecian Sphinx. Uh, we also know that we found a brother, brother Maurice. We, when we first found about the Grecian Sphinx, we actually were looking at the logo, and we felt that the logo was a griffin. Because a griffin seemed to be similar to the concept of the Grecian Sphinx. And it was our thought that that was a griffin that was there, and our brother Maurice looked up what the griffin meant in the Webster's Dictionary. And you can see that it says something about the griffin. Right. Now it talks about the fabulous bird with the wings and four legs and the ears and all of that. But in the second definition of a griffin, origin unknown, it says a white person new to the east. What? Yeah. One recently come from the Occident. That means what? White land. That's deep. And then a griffin, griffinage, the state of being a white person recently come from the east. Damn. And then it says griffinite, Griffin Park, Los Angeles. Oh, so the griffin stands over you. From the highest point, looking over all that you are. They call it Griffin Park, and its conclave is the Greek Theater. Somewhere up there, there's some shit we gotta go find. Somewhere up there is an unlocking of the mystery that keeps this the city of the lost angels. This is where the angels lost. They didn't win here, yeah. Hollywood. I thought that was deep. That was deep. Here is, uh, that's, that's a small picture of the Grecian Sphinx. We'll look at some more later. That's from the cover of the Bylaws and Constitution. And you can see that under the slab, there's some writing here in between there. We've got to talk about that and find out something about that. In the book called The Dictionary of, S the Dictionary of Symbols, I found they had a listing for a Grecian Sphinx. And, and what you know about Greece is it has to have breasts like a woman, face up. They said we serve one maiden only. We serve one maiden only. All of them. <laughs> and that's another picture of a Grecian Sphinx in a book on the Dictionary of Symbols. Now, and this, uh, is important. I was looking up, I have a definition here that if I can find, I want to show you uh, that has uh, some significance. I'm going to ask uh, if he would uh, to have a brother Ashwa Kwesi come up and join me, if, he, if I could be so honored. And uh, brother had just come in town today from out of town and uh, uh, brother Jamal and I and brother talked on the telephone and he looked at some of the symbolism that was encased in the Grecian Sphinx. Uh, here is a larger uh, version. I'm going to get an even larger uh, version. But there's certain things there that you should take a look at uh, just before I step back a second. Remember there's Sigma Pi Phi. Look at the tail in the form of an S. Sigma. The wings are in flight. There's the urn. The urn has significance. 
Now in another picture, I'll show that in the urn is the 360 degrees of knowledge. There's a little wheel in there that goes, this little circular wheel. I'm going to show you that uh, off of another picture. Uh, again, we just go through another link in. There's that concept of that round table again. Uh, you got to pull back on symbols. When I looked in the dictionary of symbols, it said under the word pi, it says pi comes from the Chinese word that means round table. Sigma pi phi. Anyway, that's, that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, brother, I've asked, I've asked brother to share with you, let me find the best picture of it. Let's see, I said it here. Uh, ask that he can share with you, uh, and I'm going to ask if he would do this one again just before we do that. If he would, uh, do, okay, you hold that one. I have this one here. I'll show it. I'll put it up while you do it. I can put it up. Okay, uh, if he could explain again, just so we can get it on the camera, about what that, what that means, which is put in there for, just not arbitrary. When you're dealing in Masonic symbolism or secret society symbolism, you're not arbitrarily picking things and putting them there. And I just want him to say again what that might mean, uh, just for the record. First of all, I want to say hotel. 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 And, uh, giving thanks to Brother Copley for uh, exposing the house Negroes. <laughs> uh, keep in mind when you go back as far as you can, all of this first of all came up out of Africa. Only the symbols have been distorted, manipulated, to the point where we don't know what it means today. Now when we go back to Prometheus. Now it talks about Prometheus, where did he have to go? When the Greeks say they had to cross the burning sands, you don't go north of Greece to cross the burning sands. There's no desert in Europe. He had to cross across the Mediterranean and there's some burning sands there. What desert is that called? Sahara. 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 That's where the knowledge was. He had to go to Mount Olympus. What was Mount Olympus? That was the land of Ethiopia. This is where the light of knowledge was. So in terms of passing the torch, this was symbolic of passing the light. So when the French, by the way, when they had the French Revolution there, uh, Thomas Jefferson was also involved with that. Okay, the overthrow of the French government during that time. So, when America set up here, what statue did they give to America? The Statue of Liberty. What symbol do you see the Statue of Liberty kept holding? The torch. The torch of what? The light of what our ancestors called Haru. The light of knowledge. All coming from African people. That's why somebody knows something about us that we don't know about ourselves. They know we're the originators of the knowledge. We are the originators here. Now, brother, brother you have the other one. Uh, which one you want? Uh, this one? Okay. Now, we, we were looking for, as I showed you, the Grecian Sphinx in the other book. We were looking for every Grecian Sphinx we could find. And we found this in Manly Palmer Hall's book under the heading of the Initiation of the Pyramid. We found this picture of the Grecian Sphinx. And uh, I know you probably read the caption under there. And uh, you see there are certain symbols underneath it. Uh, this looks uh, uh, similar to, and let me just see if I can find a larger copy, brother, just to set this up for you. I want to put their logo right next to it. And I got the version of theirs, the biggest one I had, right in my hand during the lecture. Right in one spot. Oh, here we go. I want to make sure. Uh, nah, nah, that ain't it. Well, I'll find it in a second. It was the best picture of that speech that I had. Uh, well, I used this other one. Don't look like I'm going to find that one. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Okay, let, we better just go ahead off of that one. This is, uh, brother's going to go into this a little bit and help us understand what they're trying to say here. Now here, we're going to look at the uh, ancient metal nature symbols here. The symbol here, this is called Kepara. Kepara, this is the symbol for light. <coughs> this symbol here is called Ta. This symbol here is called Nea. This one here, I'm not quite familiar with the ending here. Basically what it's saying here is uh, self-creation of light of the land lord. Now, the feudal landlords in Europe came where? Here. So what they're saying here, they are the creation of light of the new landlords. Oh, shit. This is the land of the new landlords that most of us rent from the landlords. The New World Order Boys. Huh? New World, new world Order Boys. Don't own. So that's basically what they have here. So I have right here from Kemet, 
long before there were any Greek freaks around. Hey. Our ancestors have, there's the symbol of the Neb right here. Neb, creation, the Kepara symbol means to create. Wings meaning immortality, meaning spirit. That's what African people dealt with, African spirituality. That's right. And Ra meaning the light of Haru, created in the image of Ra. Again, you see the blue, because these colors, these are our colors too, by the way. Red, white, and blue. They don't belong to the Greeks. They don't belong to America. You see the blue on top of the scarab. The scarab was symbolic of the great mind. Huh? Now, in the third degree, Brother Copley said that it was the third degree that was the blue degree, is that right? Mm -hmm. That was yes. the blue degree of the knowledge, is that right? Mm -hmm. So the scarab represented the cranial cavity of the brain, of the knowledge of the mind, of Ptah, the creator of the universe, the first concept of monotheism, or concept of one God. So it is here. You have to say that over one time. The first concept of oh, one God. Hold on, Gotcha. So we go through the whole scare? Just that, yeah, just that little, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, brother. Again, you see the nev, just like you see here. Nev means what? Lord. Lord. Lord, okay? So this is Lord of creation, meaning Kepara. Wings, represent spirituality. Huh? Ra, created in the image of Ra. Why did our ancestors say we were created in the image of Ra? Because we got melanin. Ra gives us color. So we're created in the image of Ra, the light of Haru. The top of the scarab looks just like the cranial cavity of the brain. This is where the knowledge is, right? That's right. This is where if we want to our brain computer, we have to put out the knowledge that we take in, right? So it is here. The scarab was symbolic of the great mind that our ancestors called Pita. Pita was a one god concept, monotheism, and pre-dynastic Egypt. We're talking about pre-dynastic, we're talking about over 20, 30,000 years ago. So it is here. The great mind of the universe showing that the colors, again, are African, belongs to our African ancestors. Meaning the blue. When, you, when Brother Coakley was talking about the blue lodge, huh? Was the, the third degree, was the degree of what? Knowledge. Knowledge. Is that right? right. So where do you see the blue head on here? On top of the scarab, the cranial cavity of the brain. Again, the red, our ancestors always did libation. Blood represented libation. White represented trans, transcending into another state. These colors were taken off of the African temple, still there today. Many brothers have uh, been there to see this, to witness it for themselves, who are right here in this room, Brother Jamal and many others, seeing the red, white, and blue going back over three and 4,000 years ago. So it is here that when we break down the Greek freak stuff, you've got to go back into your African ancestral knowledge to see what it goes back to. Our ancestors didn't call it the Sphinx, we call it Hermakit, meaning what good over evil. We call it the Sunum Bunum, who we are told that Thales, another Greek freak, who came into Africa, and originally we didn't let them in, by the way, That's right. but it was Admosis II in the 26th dynasty that let them in as mercenaries to fight the Persians. But in any case, they came in. And when they came in, when Admosis let them in, it is here where he learned the concept of the sun and bottom. It didn't go back to Thales. And the sun and bottom was the supreme good. Now, we also had our secret lodges. But it was based off of the concept of the sun and bottom, the supreme good for the salvation of your soul. Meaning that, I know this is going to get a little out there for a minute. No, stay with it, the pineal stay with gland, it. the pineal gland in the brain, our ancestors saw was the seat of man and woman's soul. The African man and woman's soul. Jeez. So... Rahamak is facing the east. When the sun rises up in the east, it hits him right in his forehead with a pineal gland, showing the suppressing of a beastly nature in man. Mm. So the Greek freaks, we didn't let them in because they were on a beastly level. I have pictures showing Greeks poking each other in the butt. You see, that's why this is not a new thing for them. Okay? It's not a new thing. And also by who day? Riding the hump. Riding the hump. Riding the hump. Right. You can go get the uh, demonology of the Bible. Written in uh, excuse me, in uh, 1657, uh, huh? Before the King James version of the Bible, they had demonology of the Bible, and they had this goat. That's right. And they rode this goat, and this was the the uh, Satan worship or bestiality that they were in, huh? So when the Masons said that they ride in the hump, this is the initiation for the beast, the beast that they're coming out of, huh?
So they never had the concept of the son and bottom, the supreme good. So our ancestors taught this because we understood that if you went at the net of rules that they call nature today, that if you didn't go at a divine level, it would open up the negative forces of nature to you. So you had to come through initiation from your high nature, not from your low nature. So the Greek freaks who came from their low nature didn't understand none of this. So when they went at the forces of Neteru, like studying the concept of the atom, that they tell us Democrates brought the concept of the atom. No, he studied it from Kemet. That's why they were able to produce a hydrogen bomb. Because only a beast could produce a hydrogen bomb. That's right. huh? Because he wanted nature at a negative, on the beastly level. Right. So the concept that we run around talking about, I'm this religion and I'm that religion, we didn't have no religion. That's right. We had African spirituality. spirituality. Huh? Right. Finding yourself one in the universe. Right. Right. Something that the beast, you see right here, represented as themselves, haven't dealt with yet. So the concept of Hormachet showing the suppressing of the beastly nature in man to rise up the sun and bottom. And by the way, uh, my brother, let me mention that uh, the Grecian ma uh, a maiden mm. is on top of the Capitol building. Mm. Okay. That's, uh, and they just took it down oh, for yeah. cleaning, too. Oh, is that right? Yes, okay. the Grecian maiden right now. Right. Right. is on top of the Capitol building in relationship with Brother Coco Oh, wow. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. And by the way, there's some brothers in Japan, and uh, they also wanted me to... Uh, uh, let you know that they're over there. The brothers brought me all the way to Japan to lecture to them at, uh, uh, in Tokyo, Yokota, and Masawa. And uh, these are brothers who are in the military. What? And got conscious while they were in the service. Mm. Right. <laughs> got conscious while they were in the service. That's right. So uh, they brought me over to lecture. And uh, there was some in a place called Zama who uh, unfortunately got caught with the beast. They, they married the cave woman. Oh. And, uh, outside of Zama, outside of Zama, we everything went smoothly. But the brothers, the brothers and sisters over there uh, were highly enlightened with the information. Only the brothers in Zama who realized that this was about African nation building, to bringing together us as an African people, and they realized that they had to give up the white wives. So they had a hard time with that. But I'll let them wrestle with that in their own dream state. <laughs> this is. This is actually a brother Aswa, the largest size version of the Boulez logo itself. This is off their uh, a rostrum. Uh, and as you can see, there's the urn and there's something in the urn. Now, we've always talked about the circle within the circle as being part of that pursuit. Someone else looks at this and says, that's the 360 degrees of knowledge inside the urn. Is there any significance to that urn and that right paw being up? I know that uh, the symbol here, you can use this. right off the top of my mind, I'm saying right off the top and of my mind. I don't mean to put you on the spot either. No, no brother. problem, brother. I would say that this symbol represents the sun. That's how we represent the sun. It was a circle with a dot in the middle. Okay. That's how we represented the sun. The dot may have been the pineal gland. Also, go and look in the encyclopedia under the pineal gland. And it talks about the pineal gland. It develops your sexual behavior. Excretes the melanin excretes from your pineal gland for your development of your sexual behavior. So if the pineal gland is activated by the sun, that our ancestors have Rahamachus or Hamachus that the Greeks call a sphinx face in the east. If these folks did not live in the sun belt, that means they have an underdevelopment of a pineal gland. That's right. So this explains the beastly nature that you see out here today with all these freaks running around. That's right. Huh? With an underdevelopment of the pineal gland. Now right off the top of my mind, I would say that represents the sun. And the sun is definitely bringing 360 degrees of life on this planet. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Now, we slide over here and look at the caption under the Manly Palmer Hall picture. We see that he has a dialogue here, a brother that sure. further continues the, the uh, disagreement. Uh, isn't this interesting that where he got this analogy from was from Levi's Les Mysteries de la Kabbalah. The Mysteries of the Kabbalah is where Manly Palmer Hall wrote his analogy of the stolen legacy saying that the Grecian Sphinx, see, when they call it Grecian Sphinx, they jump into a cold language of just white people. The just white people version says that the Egyptian Sphinx is closely related to the Greek legend of Oedipus. 
The Greek legend of Oedipus, which has something to do about the <laughs> the killing of the father of the people to marry the mother of the people. Some of you want to say that, brother? That hit something? All right. Okay. Uh, it says, uh, and then it goes on to say, Oedipus was the first one to solve the riddle of the Sphinx. It says, uh, it goes on here, it says, discovering one who knew the answer uh, to her riddle, the Sphinx cast herself from the cliff which boarded the road and perished. It says, the, it says about the riddle, it mentions the riddle about, let me just read it, just uh, read into the record for what it says, and we'll leave the interpretation uh, for each and every one. Oedipus, who first solved the famous riddle uh, 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 propagandized by the mysterious creature with the body of a winged lion, the head of a woman, next to it. the body of a winged lion, the head of a woman, and uh, frequented the highway leading to Thebes. To each who passed her liar, the Sphinx addressed the question. What animal is it that in the morning goes on four feet, at noon on two feet, and in the evening on three feet? <laughs> Those who failed to answer her riddle, she destroyed. Those who failed to answer her riddle, she destroyed. Oedipus declared the answer to be man himself, who in childhood crawled upon his hands and knees, in manhood stood erect, and in old age scuffled along supporting himself by a staff. Discovering one who knew the answer to her riddle, the Sphinx cast herself from the cliff which bordered the road and perished. Maybe it is that there's a mystery behind them and we solve the mystery related to them that their ability to hide and keep something secret would be diminished and that this diminishing will force them to self-destruct. Which means there may be an active goal of figuring out just what they are and what they're doing. Yep. Sure. It says here, there is still another answer to the riddle of the Sphinx. Now this is Manly Palmer Hall stuff. Blessed revealed by the consideration of the Pythagorean values of numbers. Of course, another stolen legacy, Pythagoras. That's it, right. That's it. The four, the two, and the three produce the sum of nine. Remember those four plus four and one? Right. Four Greek female, four Greek male, one you know, the last of those fraternities were created in the 20s, the sororities. There's never been a 10th one, which is the natural number of man and also to the lower worlds. The four represents the ignorant man, the two, the intellectual man, the three, the spiritual man. Infant, humanity walks on four legs, evolving humane, humanity on two legs, and to the power of his own mind, the redeemed and illuminated Magnus as the staff of wisdom. The Sphinx is therefore the mystery of nature, the embodiment of the secret doctrine, and all who cannot solve her riddle, and, uh, and, and all who cannot solve her riddle, to pass the Sphinx is to attain personal immortality. Now that's into his description of the Greek version of the Sphinx, of which brother said there's no such thing. And uh, that uh, will one day lead us to find somewhere in their ritual. Uh, we believe that they'll give some honor and discussion to the use of this uh, Grecian speech uh, to uh, match out something or some parable that they're using internally. Now, are there any questions about the boule? Yeah. The, the Knights of Templars? Yeah, Satan, Satan with his hand up like that with the pentagram. Ah. The White House before you cut your throat before you become president. Right, Jesse Jackson cannot become the president. Dig that. That's powerful. And he mentioned this uh, about the Knights of Templar who in 1314, uh, their, um, their uh, uh, Jacques de Molay uh, was murdered, burned at the stake. And uh, Clinton... Uh, is in the order of Demolay. He's in the senior Demolays. Uh, who is the president? And uh, um, the Knights of Templar are parabled into the Skull and Bones. In Skull and Bones, they talk about the Knights and the Knights of Templar. Ye yes, brother. Don't, don't, didn't they mention the Pierre de Sound? What does that mean? Pierre, they, they evolved from the Templars. Matter of fact, um, there's a hidden secret that they propose that has something to do with uh, Christ. 
which they hold over the head of the Vatican. They control the Vatican. Mm. Who controls the Vatican? Prayer de Science does. Mm. That's an organization that came out of Templars. So mm. They killed the Templars. They killed them off. But what happened was a lot of the documents and the parts that's of the state, see, they Story. had uh, got into it with the Saracens. And the Saracens, first they took Jerusalem. Mm. And the order was from the, uh, at first, the Pope used them to go in and get all the documents of the history and everything of what happened as far as Christ is concerned and further back. They brought all those documents back. When their usefulness was finished, that's when the Pope turned on them. But, but, there's a, mer, mer, the kings of, I can't think of this name right now, it's Merovoni again, or something like that. The kings of them, which is a dynasty, that out of them came the Prayer de Sion, and they kept, they keep having it each so many years. They have a grand master, mm. which the Masons sprung out from there. Mm. Okay. They had the Masons like over here and there, and then the Prayer de still originate it's based in France and you know back into that skull and bones thing this was an article that appeared in the New York Times on skull and bones look at what the heading says the tomb George Bush came from the tomb George Bush came from in a Selvan pocket tucked off High Street masked by a blank slits in an ancient stone building called the tomb barred from the world by a padlock from uh, on door, Skull and Bones keeps his secrets close, closely, but it casts a shadow across the country. Through generations, the most influential of senior societies at Yale College has been seen by outsiders as the hand that quietly, oh so quietly, guides the nation's foreign policy, intelligence apparatus, and premier banking houses. As the hand, this say the group, it says the hand. And uh, of course, uh, their symbolism to whose bones these are and what does that skull mean? The skull in the in the Templars, in the Templars, they would put three skulls on the table. Uh, in the skull and bones, they put skulls on the table. Yes, go ahead, brother. Story of some skull and bones right here. Great lady, lady of Marcella was loved by a Templar and Lord of Sidon, but she died in her youth. And on the night of her burial, this wicked lover crept to the grave, dug up her body, and violated it. Then a voice from the void bade him to return nine months in time, for he was find a son. He obeyed in the injunction, and at the appointed time opened the grave again and found a head on the leg bones of the skeleton, skull and crossbones. The same voice bade him guard it well, for it would be the giver of all good things. And so he carried it away with him. It became his protected genius, and he was able to defeat his enemies by merely showing them the magic head in due course. It passed into the possession of the order. A blue ZX is blocking someone in. A blue ZX is blocking someone in. All right. Now, I'm going to pass this bucket around. This is a bucket for a donation for the good life. And you know they've been closed selling food for a couple of hours. So they're sitting with us. I'm going to pass this around quietly. I want you to put something in it. This is for the good life because their people have to stay over. They have to stay over past the time they get off work to stick in here with us. Now I want to make sure we cover them. Uh, I would much prefer to even make a, another pass and a half for myself. Uh, but I want to make sure we cover them for they deserve uh, to be taken care of. And I'm going to pass this around. You all make sure this gets to everybody. Uh, and make sure uh, you put something in there for Boulay. For, for <laughs> but I ought to tell you a story though. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story though. I was here talking about the boule one night. And there was a guy in the audience from one of the fraternities. And the guy says, you know in our history book, the boule is mentioned on a certain page. So at the end of the night, everybody's gone. There's three, four of us in here. Someone's mopping the floor. And I'm on the stage bending down, putting my stuff in a neat little pile. And someone, while that mop is swinging, says, you know, that guy was right. That sure is on that one page in our book. <laughs> All right. So make sure we cover the good life there. And isn't it nice to be in the good life? This is good life. But one thing I want to tell you, I, I'll get to you. One thing I want to tell you is that their use of analogies is not about good. This is about the evil prostitution. We're talking about the evil of evils. We ought to be as a goal, as a group, 
trying to penetrate or find the chief of evil. That's right. And this chief of evil will control or have dabs on a many other people who are so evil. Some who won't understand evil but do evil in support of evil things. And so we keep up the fact that they took the good things and made a bad thing with it. Now questions. Brother right in there. That's three of y'all so y'all got to decide who's going to do it. The elder first. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering about the um, Hoover's, uh, the, the, the uh, blacks around Hoover are like North Zat and the guy that he had to find on Marcus Garvey. Uh, were they in the pool yet? Could you say that? I mean, uh, were there any connection between them and, and uh, Hoover? You said what guy around Hoover? Uh, one is named North Zat, Hoover's valet, I think. And then the guy that I don't, I can't recall his name, but I know that he was a. Uh, he was uh, sent by Hoover to infiltrate the FBI. And can you say anything about, I mean, I'm just wondering about musicians, uh, you, you know, musicians, it seems, you know, like jazz musicians, it seems like that they're in and out of the White House all the time. Uh, what do you say about them? I mean, like Sammy Davis and, and uh, uh, let me just stop you there. I, let me just stop you there at that part. I really don't know about the jazz and why they're at the White House. I, I really don't. I have nothing I could add to that. I don't know the name that you mentioned, but because you mentioned the name, I'm going to look the name up. I'll give you a number where you can contact me and uh, give me a little bit to get back east. I'm going to look the name up in the founding chapters. and See, because we, the reason we keep a book from 53 or uh, 69 and, and 83 is that the various books feature certain things during their era, and the guy named who he mentioned might be more highlighted in the 55 book than in the 84 book. So uh, I'm going to look that name down for you and see if I can find something to it. Yes, brother, with that. No, he was not. He was higher and more direct and together than that. Brother Warren and then the brother over here. Yeah, I might mention you might want to get a profile. E.T. Bell was like leading the story to mathematics. Hold on, where's that good life bucket at? <laughs> okay. It's called the, uh, the Magic of Numbers. And he's talking about uh, the, the Pythagoreans, which we know got their information from Timon. The, num the secret numbers they were worshiping, which eventually... Became Everybody take care of good life? We all straight? Yeah. Never got a boy. I book, might need another bucket to bucket so damn full. Look at Jay. Drop the peanuts. To have it. <laughs> Somebody, would you just walk it over there so that they can get it? We make sure this is done. I don't want it to distract something we're talking about while we're talking. Go ahead, brother. Yes, brother Warren. The magic of numbers. The magic of numbers by G. Bell of Caltech. Okay. And he talks about how the, the secret numbers that the Pythagoreans were studying, as you know, Pythagoras, so-called Pythagoras theorem is the basis of all uh, measurements and so forth. Uh, their numbers are the basis of where you get the H-bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And the other thing is Brother Quasi mentioned Taylor, who supposedly, again, the first person who studied sine waves. And anybody knows anything about physics or, or mechanical engineering or optics, you know, that the sine wave is the basis of, of all those uh, uh, sciences. And of course, we know where so-called Thales got his knowledge from. So there's a lot of stuff in Kemet being used today against us. And therefore, we have to learn it if we ever going to defend ourselves. Excuse me a second. Brother, I'm going to have to take your film. And the reason I'm going to have to take it is that the rule is there's no shooting of the audience. And as you can see, these brothers don't shoot the audience. Because unless someone says it's all right with them, I, I don't really like that. And so I'm going to take it and fix it up for you and give it back to you. Make sure that you get the right copy of everything. But I have to protect them. Not that anything could happen to them. But as you can see, they don't do it. And they know I've argued with them. These are my friends. And we've argued. And that's just... That's just a policy that uh, we don't like to do. That. There's some fresh juices coming in back there for those who are thirsty and uh, didn't quite get to it. Uh, yes, brother. Yes, sir, brother. Say it's turn. Okay. Uh, let me pass. Let me pass this across. Damn, this thing is heavy. Shit. Woo. Okay. Pass it back up in there. I don't think it made it back there, and then it did. It's been around. Okay, uh, then let's uh, somebody from the from the good life come and pick the bucket up. 
My brother asked about Carter G. Woodson and W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois was the founding member of the New York chapter in 1911. The concept of the talented Tiff developed at a speech that he gave on behalf of the Boule, which was that the Boule represented the elite of the black elite, the college trained man. There was no other black man of influence than this emerging college educated black man. And so this college educated black man uh, was, uh, was uh, put in or used by uh, a lot of other people. Um, W.B. Du Bois uh, took it upon himself and uh, in the lecture on uh, black Jewish relations, Africa 93, uh, we talked about uh, W.B. Uh, du Bois the role uh, in attacking Marcus Garvey. Well, it was deeper than we ever thought. We found out that the Harlem Renaissance, in fact, in fact, was a distraction established by Jewish philanthropy to deter Africans from back to Africa to get involved in poetry, art, science, uh, music, uh, as a distraction and a diversion from the goals and aspirations of Marcus Garvey. Du Bois, along with the first black Rhodes Scholar, Elaine Locke, who was 1908 to 1910. There was not another Rhodes Scholar till 1963 that Elaine Locke I was a part with Du Bois of humiliating Marcus Garvey by calling them names like Gorilla, Dark, Dumb Masses, and they hedged their bet. We have found documentation where Du Bois and Elaine Locke had stated clearly that we hope this white man delivers because we've crushed a great black thing. But we know the white man will be delivered or our people will attack us and plague us forevermore. You didn't know that they played and hedged their bet that Marcus Garvey was wrong about the white man. Marcus Garvey was not wrong about the white man. And by never telling you who they are, you can never hold them responsible for the bet they made when they put the money to win on the white man. Carly Woodson, years after being a boule, wrote a book, The Miseducation of the Negro. Years after having been used in the founding member of the D.C. boule in 1908, knew that education, see, these were college, the key to all of these men were college education. So when he saw, saw what had happened to him, he said we were miseducated by the damn thing. It was a, it was a fix. And that was having, coming to expose something that he had been. Du Bois, years after been left to dry by the boule, left to dry by the NAACP, whose leader, Joel Spingard, and his mentor had been a spy for military intelligence, which came out in the Memphis Commercial Appeal story, that, that showed that Du Bois, too, years later, sought to repent for what he had done. But he never exposed the boule. He only personally felt humiliated for having bet wrong. And that's why we had to know that they made a bet, that there was an organized cross-out. He never told the secrets related to the boule. Hold on just a second, but yes, brother. All right, um, what you were saying earlier at the beginning, all right, listening to all of this, and I heard you on the radio Monday morning, all right, now, this is going to be out of all of us, uh, or even if we compare it to the mass populace, this is going to be 80% of us, and if you show them the truth and put it right in front of their face, they still are going to deny it. They ain't going to want to admit up to it. They don't give a shit about it, pardon me, lady. They don't give a damn about none of this black stuff. I saw that looking at um, Minister Society. You talk black to these young kids now, and I'm 40 years old. I grew up in the, in the black movement where it was something to be proud of. How do we go about explaining this to these young gangbangers who are future warriors? Since they don't give a damn about them, why not channel their energy, like Farrakhan used to say, into for our liberation? If you don't give a damn about dying, you make the best soul. All right, now all of us in here, most of us are going to go out, most of us are going to forget what we've heard, most of us are going to... Hold it, stop now, stop now. Are you going to forget what you heard? Oh, no, I'm not. Then you can only speak for yourself. Don't speak against anyone else. Stop now. I want you to turn to them and tell them that you won't speak for them like you just did. Turn to them and tell them you won't speak for them like you... Because you said something negative about them. I don't like to say that. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. But what can we do as a unit or as a people to educate the others that maybe have not had a chance to come in here and get this knowledge gotcha. that you have spread. Okay. I would suggest probably at this day, 
which is July 6, 1993, that I could walk in most of the cities and bring you the people who had those organizations that you talked about. And right now they could stand up here and turn to you and do just what I did because their lessons are done privately, yours are done publicly. If you went to the gang summit in Kansas City and they got through discussing, well, what are we going to do now, all that we work together? You watch the Bloods and the Crips. You watch this one and that one. From all those cities stood up and say, well, let's do what Copley does. Let's work on those names he gave us. So I make a suggestion to you that everybody that's on it might not look like they're on it. Everybody that knows it doesn't have to say, hey, guess what? I know it. I think we want to make sure that each and every person can handle themselves. And if you can take this and teach another person, then whatever it is that's out there that another person doesn't like, which is what people do when they don't know who the enemy is, they beat themselves. Part of what we do by exposing who the enemy is, is we stop misplaced aggression. So we can look at the numbers and see that the crowds are increasing, and more people know than they ever knew, and I think those youngsters might know more than the adults. And to tell you honestly, I place my bet on them. That's right. That's right. I place my bet on the little ones who don't have jobs, who didn't go to school, who don't have the cars nor the houses, because they're the ones that are going to fight. They just need to know who to fight and how to fight effectively. There were not college-educated Vietnamese who dug deep holes in the grounds and lived with rats, dogs and cats, and worms, and other things that scare Americans. I suggest to you that there are elements who are ready while we work with the masses to have them understand what they'll come to witness. You see, if you don't get this lesson to see what's going on, when it happens, you get confused and think something went wrong. And again, remember this. We're the horse that lays on the rail. We're not breaking ass till it says spinning out of the turn. Here's the track. We started here. Somebody say, hey, that's Billy. He's way out in front. Well, we're going to get no points for leading. But as we make it around that track, we might be laying at the road. Here comes the Boulay. Here comes the Rhodes Rothschild. Here comes Skull and Bones. They're way out in front. But when that man say, here they come spinning out of the turn, then somewhere that black liberation horse going to kick ass, and from here to there, we're going to finish right. The goal is to finish first. So somewhere down the line, we're not going to look good. Because looking good is not necessarily the single signal you want to send before you strike. So you might, I tell people, you better be able to run out of your house in any of four directions and have someplace buried straight edges, clothes, uh, flashlights, and other things, food that you may need. And you won't know how many people have prepared for this until you go out and dig your hole because you might look up and not find room for your stuff. All right. Yes, yes, bro. Let, let me ask you a question. Do you think the boule can be used in a way to manipulate the United States government as in uh, what they did in France in like about 1983? The, the Communist Party took over and they took the Rothschild Bank there and nationalized all of their personal holdings in France. This was just in the 80s. So. Uh, that nationalization in France did not in any way inhibit the Rothschild finance. Right. In the context of that, if you have money, and someone says, well, there's your money in the pot, and you change who supervises it, as long as they know where it go and where it's spent, who to give it to, you don't really care who tends to it. Like, you don't care if Bradley is the mayor, Bradley know what butt to kiss. He can be that person. And, and... What was the other part of your question? Can, can, can oh, can it be used? Oh, oh, this is interesting. That's an interesting statement. On the radio once in D.C., a lady called in who said her father was a boule, and she said that, how do you know that these boule don't feel the way you feel about the white man? I said, well, the goal is, is that while we're passing in the night, I'm going to turn my light on and say, who go there? And they got to identify themselves, and the goal is that we're going to get the wizard late one night. And they have to decide whether they're with us, whether they're against us, or they're just going to call in sick and take a walk. So they've got to identify their role while we're in the process of searching and destroying the beast. 
So that it's up to them to identify where, because they're already into a context of mixed signals. One thing I wanted to show you before it got too late is that this boule, in fact, picks their people and makes their people uh, leaders. And this is from the book uh, on the Rockefeller family. Uh, and this is in the index, in the footnote on page 424. It talked about how Whitney Young wouldn't come against the Rockefellers at the Charlottesville Massacre. And this talks about how the Rockefellers do most of their boule leaders. Junior had maintained his junior Rockefeller, had maintained the contact with black organizations begun with his involvement in Tuskegee, Hampton, Spelman, and other southern colleges at the turn of the century. For a time, he had token donations of some $500 a year to the NAACP. However, in 38, his philanthropy advisor, Arthur Packer, wrote a letter to Rockefeller questioning the future of this relationship because he was upset that the NAACP was insisting on trying to push, push an anti-lynching bill. So Rockefeller wasn't going to give up money because they were punching anti-lynching. Packer regarded this as radical, act too radical for the Rockefellers to be involved in, but recommended a continuation of the annual donation nevertheless. Abrupt termination of the $500 gift might be regarded as a rebuke and would carry in the possibility of some kind of controversy. This is the source. At the same time, it's a NAACP file Rockefeller Family Archive. At the same time, he was concerned about the radical program of the NAACP. However, Packard was enthusiastically behind the program of the Urban League, beginning with their support of the organization in the 1920s. The Rockefellers were contributing nearly 35% of the league's budget by 1940 and were deeply involved in the internal affairs and management. After returning from the Army, and, uh, returning from the Army Winthrop Rockefeller, who went to Arkansas, became governor, went on the league's board of trustees, and in 1952 contributed $100,000 towards a permanent headquarters. When Winthrop left for Arkansas and the league began to drift, the Brothers Fund, that's Rockefeller Brothers Fund head, Dana Creel, searched for someone to take over the leadership role. This is Rockefeller looking for someone to run the Urban League. Creel wrote Winthrop, I have had several talks with Lindsey Kimball about the Urban League situation and the possibility of going on the board to see what he could do from the inside. One, to strengthen the board, sharpen the possibility, and redirect the program. Three, help in the selection of Granger Lester's aging white director of the league's successor. Urban League files Rockefeller Family Archives. Kimball, who became chairman of the league's board, had heard Whitney Young speak in 57, uh, 57 sociology convention. Then a professor at Southern Negro College, Young had reached the top of his profession. He had reached the top of his profession. He had little, he had little or no hope of being hired by a northern school. He was respect, receptive to Kimball's suggestion that he belonged in the action arena. Here's a white man said, look, nigga, you belong in the action arena. <laughs> Kimball then arranged for both Young and his wife to receive a two-year general education. That's Rockefeller. That became the Rockefeller Foundation. General Education Board Fellowship for postgraduate work at Harvard. Meanwhile, he persuaded, persuaded Granger to step down, soften the blow by a grant for a two-year traveling fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation. With Granger out of the picture, Kimball installed Young as Urban League's executive director. It says, uh, in the next decade, Young, who had joined King, Wilkins, and Farmer as the movement's big four, would raise the league's budget from $325,000 to $6 million, making it the country's blue chip civil rights organization. And it goes on to tell you that Rockefeller gave most of that money. That's the, that's the creation of a boule. It isn't just that they were trained in those Negro schools of which most presidents are boule, but the fact that for doing that, they would be picked and put in places, and that picking and putting was the authority of the, uh, of, the, uh, um, of the whites. One other thing I need to show you here is that in the past, the boule has been mentioned in the black press. This is the main black paper, the Washington Afro-American, talking about Epsilon boule, talking about a nice big dinner, naming the names, and they had filet mignon, and all the trimmings, and it was at the J.W. Marriott Capital Ballroom a week before Christmas. It's that. But it just shows that the black press knew of the organization. But their writing on the organization has been puff pieces like this. Continue success to all members of the area of Boulay, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, and to others throughout the nation. That's the Washington, D.C. paper, the Afro-American. Here's the Amsterdam News, a very uh, aggressive black newspaper in New York. Here's a Boulay dinner there with the Sigma Pi Pi and thanking the families and listing the names. Again, my suggestion is, is that the black press has known 
and has never told. And the reason that they've never told is that many of those founding members of the various black presses uh, are Boulé families. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that that's in a lot. Yes, brother. I, I don't want to talk, but I want to go ahead when we're talking about all the survival thing. But uh, the brothers that are real hardcore want to be up on some things. You need to get a copy of the, uh, the Army Field Manual uh, mapping book. That's the name of it. Official training maps manual. You should have to navigate the version of Lindsay Compton. Just like the names on the camera. Lindsay Compton. One good book you'll need, and another good book you'll need is the uh, Alchemist Cookbook. You can use that survival store, teach you all the little neat tricks. These are the uh, particular tools that all the mercenary groups throughout the world train with. The reason they use the Army Field Manual and Map and Contour book is that uh, they came by the U.S. Army been out a while, and that's the best book we'll get on the subject. Also, uh, they have the Durban Go Roller Unit out in, and their base of operation out here is in Monterey, California, that's the U.S. Army. These boys didn't come out during the ride. They, they wear black suits, black berets, mm. and they're kind of relaxed and, uh, you know, the, that 35 10 is not there. You know, that neat cut military look. Matter of fact, they're tall to look relaxed, not to shave and all that. But if they want to use them during the day, they have to. They're not military personnel. They're right. All spook units. And I can show you that uh, that those various units are being told now to move into communities. They're taking simple positions as grocery store baggers, uh, a crossing guards, traffic coordinators. And I'm going to tell you something. Just yesterday, for the first time, I saw one of them damn streets with them cameras over the intersection. Y'all ought to be ashamed of yourselves. They're going to whip that on every nigga in the country because you let it happen to you. You're the only city in the country with cameras over the intersection.